welcome to episode 12 of The Animal Heartbeats. I'm Kieran Bourget and I'm joined here live in Barcelona at ECVIM Congress by my podcasting brother, Jose Novo Matos. Hello, Jose. Hi, Kieran. This will be the very first time that you and I have recorded a podcast in the same location rather than via Zoom. So uh, it's quite a landmark episode for us. And I'm a bit sad because it marks the end of our first season of the Animal Heartbeat. Um, it's true. Which is, is is quite a moment, I think. I, I've yeah. I've had a um, a great experience doing this, and uh, and the next couple of days chatting to these amazing cardiologists, I think will be uh, will be super fun too. Uh, how are you enjoying the congress so far? I, I've had a great time. It's been very sociable. Absolutely, it's good to be back, like a normal face to face in person meeting, isn't it? Uh, it is. I felt like that last year and then I got COVID. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looking around, everyone is really very happy to be back to normal life. And I, I was just talking to one of the organizers and apparently this is the biggest ECVM ever with 1,700 really? um, wow. um, participants. Yeah, very cool. So we have a pre-Congress day. Uh, the European Society of Veterinary Cardiology organized a pre-Congress day. on. It was interesting, wasn't it? What were your thoughts? Did you did you like it? Yeah, I did. I'll be I'll be very honest. I was teaching in the morning, so uh, I joined I joined uh, late in the morning lectures. Um, but there was some really interesting stuff, and some of the comparative work on imaging the mitral valve in humans was absolutely brilliant. Uh, you know, some of the three D imaging is just fantastic, and it always makes me think about my two D images differently, and and what my anatomy is there. Yeah, very good. You had like this great human cardiology uh, speaker making those comparisons between dogs and humans was great and a, a lot of very good basic research and state-of-the-art lectures now in a standard cardiology sessions there's a lot of very interesting research abstracts going on and yeah now that we are here uh, Kieran in Barcelona and there are a lot of hotshot cardiologists walking around and, we're, uh, we're standing amongst giants here, aren't we? Exactly. It's fantastic. And I feel we should take advantage of that. Absolutely. We just thought for this special ECVM episode to go around and chat with some of the speakers at the meeting and some other cardiologists that are attending the meeting to ask them about their special fields of interest. Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity uh, to talk to people one to one. I think we should just go and see who we can find. We should just apologize in advance because this is a live recorded series of interviews. There may be some differences in sound quality to the usual high quality production. So hopefully it won't affect everybody's experience too much. We are very happy to have here with us today, Professor Roberto Santilli. Roberto is a professor of veterinary cardiology at the University of Cornell and is the head of the cardiology department of the clinical uh, clinic veterinary Malpensa, and uh, we'll be talking today about supraventricular uh, tachycardias. Welcome, Roberto. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Great to have you here. It's a, a fantastic opportunity to catch up at the ECVM Congress and, and have a conversation with some experts. What we would like to talk to you about is your experience and your research work in understanding atrial depolarization waves in supraventricular tachycardias. All right, so you know, I've been doing studies on supraventricular arrhythmia since probably 2005, 2006. Right. At the beginning, I, I have to say, it was really a mess. I mean, everybody <laughs> was just talking about atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardia, and that's probably that what was there. That's what we were taught in school. Yeah, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's what you usually yeah. study. And so then I start doing EP mapping, and, and a real, a new world opened. Wow. And, and so I start map different tachycardia, starting from what happened in human, and I try to find differences in dogs. Okay. So we work, first of all, on trying to find the new way of placing precordial, because also for this, we had several problems, according to the different conformation of the thorax right. in the dog, we had different problems. Now, we publish a paper where we actually know exactly where to put V1, and so we can have a, a real understanding of the depolarization, either for the atrial or for the ventricle. And so starting from there, we collected hundreds of cases of mapping in different arrhythmias. And so now I think we are actually, I can say, almost done with it. 
-hmm. particularly for uh, bucalitral tachycardia, for all the reciprocating tachycardia and atrial flutter. So we published those in our paper about this three different topics. So now the last two are, I think, the most important because we have now an algorithm to diagnose pre-excitation pattern in dogs. Right. And according to the electrocardiographic characteristics, you can actually now localize the accessory pathway before ablation. And we tested, it's actually working from 15 kilos dog up to, you know, a bigger body weight. And now we know when it's anterior, so dangerous because it's close to the his bundle, or when it's posterior, because it happened to us that the owner came from all over Europe, sure. and maybe they came in our hospital, and then the accessory pathway was anterior, so close to the his. And it so, changes how we think about them, doesn't it, and what, how we act for that case. Yeah, oh yeah, completely, because, I mean, if, if it's anterior, they don't, they don't want to risk in damaging the his bundle, so we publish paper also on this topic, and if you use low uh, power, you can actually also do this type of ablation, but there is always a risk of damaging, you know, the his bundle and then to you know, the need of, of a pacemaker. Sure. And so if they don't want to have this risk, they actually, they don't come. And so they can save money for traveling and so on. And so this is, was our first algorithm. <clears throat> and I think it's kind of, it's actually working. And now we just published a very, very important paper about 182 SVT that we map over the years. This, this was the project of my senior resident, Dr. Stefano Battaglia, and he actually won the best research abstract uh, last year at nice. ECVIM. Great opportunity for a young researcher to be involved yeah. in something like this. It's yeah, like that's fantastic. really that's important a... also for his career too. Yeah, yeah. I still remember it's... the diagram. You had a beautiful diagram of an ECG. Yeah, yeah, word, yeah. Like yeah. That's, that comes or... exactly yeah. from all our works because we could do all the measurements because with EP mapping, you can actually see exactly where the atrial depolarization right. is located during the SVT. And starting from there, we, we measure the distance from, you know, the previous QRS compass and the next one, doing some ratio, some area under the curve with all the cutoff to do the differential diagnosis between focal atrial tachycardia and reciprocating tachycardia or between sinus tachycardia and focal atrial tachycardia. I think these two algorithms will help a lot, you know, cardiologists all over the world yeah. then studying this very, very difficult topic. Yeah, I, I think even as uh, experienced cardiologists, we still have to look hard at those ECGs. We can't sight read that. We've, we've got to think about it. So this is great because this is going to help us and, and you know, the, the rest of the cardiology community. Yeah. Can, can we call it P prime or should we call it atrial depolarization? You can actually, I mean, we prefer to call it atrial depolarization okay. because you never know if it's an F of, of oh, flutter. Uh, so, you know, sure. if it's a P prime, it's just for focal atrial tuck or right. reciprocating. Yeah. But then if it's a flutter, it's an F. So that's why we like to call it. Another interesting thing, just to finish, is that next year uh, in February in Milan, there will be an English uh, seminar where we, c we will actually test it with several cardiology from all over the world, these two algorithms. You're live, so with with the uh, this type of you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just it's gonna be anonymous, and okay. so we will try to see using. We will present obviously the two algorithm first, and then all the cardiology will vote according to the ECG they can actually have in paper, and they decide. And we will see how good is these two algorithm in the diagnosis. So I'm super excited in this type of event that will be in Milan next uh, next February. That's very cool indeed. Brilliant. Hey, uh, Roberto, thank you so much for all the work you've been doing. Very exciting. And we will encourage everyone to, to read those two most recent papers. Final question. What's the future? Uh, what could be a game changer besides what we have done already? Uh, what's in the pipeline? What do you okay, so yeah, that's a good point. So because now, as you probably heard, there are some new technique, particularly the 3D mapping that, you know, reconstruct the heart with, you know, a voltage mapping and activation mm. mapping. And I've been working with Dr. Xu at Cornell. We have this machine and we are actually planning to buy also in Malpensa in Milan. The problem with this is that 
there are a, a lot of people that look this technique and it looks very, very, you know, kind of easy. The problem that if you don't know all the background, I mean, you can make up, make, make up things. So you can create circuits, you can create isthmuses. And so we are working. I think the future probably for ventricular arrhythmia will be the CARTO or the NAVEX, all these 3D mapping things. But for SBT, probably, I don't think there is a lot of room because it's so easy. Easy. It's so, I mean, it's so sort of straightforward. <laughs> easy, yeah. easy, yeah. easy, <laughs> easy is too much. It's a straightforward to, to do with the conventional mapping. And you actually, for the CARTO technique, it takes seven hours to have all the mapping <laughs> and maybe I mean when we do ablation now with our experience in 40 minutes we are done so wow. you know I don't know right very cool exciting exciting stuff thank you so much Roberto you are very welcome thank you now we're honored to be joined by Professor David Connolly from the Royal Veterinary College in London uh, to talk to us about cardiomyopathy in cats and, and what's coming next welcome David Thank you. Great to be here. Very good to have you here, David. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, very exciting, but we have no treatments uh, to address the disease at all. Uh, is there any hope? Is there any stuff in the pipeline that could help us treating this disease? That's a great question, Jose. I mean, I think there's been many years when we've all been a little depressed on, on no real movement with respect to treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think that's partly because it's such an amazingly heterogeneous disease yeah. with uh, potentially so many different gene mutations. At least, you know, that's what we're seeing from the genetic architecture in humans and we suspect possibly in cats. Um, but I think there's some interesting things on the horizon and there's some stuff that's been coming out very recently even in the veterinary literature. Um, so I guess, if I may, I might, I might focus on two areas which are of very recent interest and I'm going to throw a wild card in at the end. Just <laughs> we for, love a wild just, card. <laughs> just for the fun of it. That's what that. a cat would do if it could do this for you. It could so, do this. Yeah. And then you could get all the, I don't know if you get feedback, all the controversy could be lying off left, right, and centre. <laughs> I'll have left the room by then. I'll tell you, it breaks out on Twitter. Oh, sorry, <laughs> on X. On, yeah. X, on X, yes. Yeah. Um, so I guess the first thing is, um, and I think um, Virginia mentioned this in a previous podcast, is, is the excitement about these myosin inhibitors. Oh, yeah. And um, there's a couple out there. The first one was uh, Mavicamptin. Um, and what they are, they, they basically are inhibitors of the ATPase of myosin. Um, and what does that mean? What that means is that we think in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, certainly with uh, been shown in myosin binding protein C3 and myosin heavy chain genes, that we've got a hypercontractile situation. Right. And that is a consequence of an increase in the number of actin and myosin interactions. And being a very simplistic kind of guy, I kind of think we've got this idea of, they talk about the relaxed, the super relaxed state where the heads of the myosin are kind of fairly well laid back and they're not interacting with the actin. And then we have the interactive state when they're actually interacting and doing the business. And then there's that in-between state, which is called the disordered um, state. And in HCM, certainly in humans, there seems to be an increase in the disordered state. Well, that's kind of, I kind of think about it is, you remember those American trains which, uh, freight trains which go on forever. Forever, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so I sure. kind of think of this in the super relaxed state. You've got laid back guys in their jeeps and they're happy to lay back, <laughs> and smoke yeah. a cigarette, and wait for the train to go by. But in HCM, you've got all these boy racers who are just waiting for that train uh, to get across. And they're not going anywhere. And they're not yeah, going yeah. anywhere. Okay, and they're in the disordered state, just ready to go. So HCM's a bit like that. And as soon as that train's gone, you know, they're, they're across there. They're off. So, you know, we've got far more rapid interaction between the um, heavy chain, the myosin heavy chain, and the tropomy uh, sorry, and the actin. And so, what these inhibitors do is they get more of these disordered states into the super relaxed state, and so they just calm everything down. And you know, that's shown to be really um, beneficial in a number. Well, initially in in rodent trials. Yeah. So when you've got um, rodents in which they have genetically engineered yeah. hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with specific mutations, and they're generally the um, heavy chain mutations, so myosin and 
um, heavy chain myosin. Yeah. And then they've now gone into phase three, phase two, and phase three trials, particularly with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, with mevacaptin, and shown that they are able to reduce the severity of the obstruction to the point that you know that the, the, some patients were going for septal myectomy. That's no longer necessary. Um, that's right. amazing, yeah, it's isn't huge. it? It's huge. So yeah. you know, that's kind yeah. of really, yeah. really interesting yeah. stuff. So. I think one of the questions that was being asked at this stage was, yeah, they might work for mice and heavy chain, they might work for mice and binding protein C3, which we accept in humans is 60% of the mutations, yeah. but will they work for other, you know, what we call the... Um, light chain. Light chain, light chain. Light chain. Yeah. Um, But there's recent evidence now showing that in rodent models, these can certainly work, work the light chains. And so we're things like tropomycin or even the troponin mutations. So, you know, it could actually be across the board. It's very really would mean like we don't care about which mutation yeah. the patient might have, the drug might still work, which could be very handy for us. Yeah. For us yeah. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. Can I just ask you something? Was it, what I really like about all this stuff of biosin inhibitors is pimobendin. Because I always hated mm -hmm. to give pimobendin in HCM. I thought that this <laughs> ma makes no sense. So now, as, as you described really well, if this is a hypercontractility issue and we are giving drugs, that decreases hypercontractility even in, in patients that would require septobiectomy. So these are not our early subclinical HCM people, are people with nasty disease. Yeah. Can we drop the, the argument that pimobendin might be useful in the cats? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bring your fibrosis. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but I, I think further down the stage of yeah. the disease where we've got um, systolic dysfunction, Oh, yeah. Is that what you mean? I'm out of that. No, think absolutely. There's still yeah. a role yeah. no, for yeah. Yeah. Now. But not at early stage C, let's say. No, no, not at early okay, stage. Okay, great. Yeah, 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 and yeah, I think yeah, people yeah. people look at all the stuff in dogs. And they say, oh, stage B2 in dogs. Oh, look, this cat's got big atria. Maybe we should start. No. Uh, yeah. and, and none yeah. of us would. But yeah. I think there are people out there who would consider it. Right. Absolutely. Especially stage um, C, isn't it? I think there are, there are a lot C. of people. Yeah. That yeah. We yeah. start yeah. with PM on stage C. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I went through a phase where I was much more liberal with PM and, and and the more experience I get, I guess, and the more data that comes out, the more I back away from it. And I use it in the ones with systolic dysfunction. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. You know, where they don't have bad outflow tract yeah. obstruction. But I think what we're talking about here is there's potential for B1, it isn't there? And that's that's. The, no, no, the thing that, that would be amazing to achieve. I guess the other thing just to mention, of course, is that the great Josh Stern has yeah. actually done some initial work in this to show that you know, if you give a pill to a cat, it doesn't drop dead 10 seconds later. Yeah. So yeah. we know that um, avacamptin, as well as the mavacamptin, they both can be given and be tolerated by cats. And he has shown that um, they can reduce the, the severity of outflow tract obstruction. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that's all. All quite positive. What um, was he done? Some nice initial work with that. Yeah, re really good. And I think what was really interesting about that was the not sort of clinical data actually, but but just the story of it. In that he found some mild anti-hypertrophic effect and wanted to do more, but the drug company said, "Oh, hey, we've got a route to market through yeah. reducing outflow tract obstruction because that's such a big deal in humans. So we're not going to see mavacamptin in in cats for a long time. I think rapamycin has got potential." Yeah, so I think that's the other thing. Again, Josh is, you know, always head of the great game, that man. Oh, yeah, he's got his finger, <laughs> finger on the pulse, suddenly, that cardiologist. So, um, I mean, rapamycin, an old, old drug, macrolide. Yeah. And um, it, can it be repurposed? This has come a bit, for, again, it's, a lot of it's come from rodent models, which are, in this case, not engineered HCM models. These are aortic banding aortic models, band, so it's a yeah. pressure load um, issue. So it's not identical. But there's also some work looking at renal transplant where this is used um, for renal transplants where there may be some change or has been shown change in the um, thickness of the ventricular wall, you know, coincidentally in these transplant people. Hmm. So again, and this is where it gets really quite, you know, me and pathways, how excited I get about pathways. So this is really quite interesting in that um, how it may be functioning is through this mTOR. And this mTOR is a bit like a air traffic controller and it sits there and it does it, it, it controls pathways to all sorts of different genes and basically affects hypertrophy fibrosis glucose tolerance all sorts of things. all the stuff that goes wrong yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so and also quite interestingly and vitally importantly I think um, the action on autophagy 
Mm. So everyone's going, now what's he on about? Connolly, shut up. But autophagy <laughs> is really, really important. <laughs> And autophagy is basically how a cell cleans itself and basically gets rid of um, dead organelles. And we know that in many cases of heart disease and other diseases outside the heart, sure. one of the big issues is that when autophagy starts to, to become dysfunctional, and that results in basically all sorts of other pathways and ultimately um, death of the cell, damage to mitochondria, damage to energy metabolism, all the sort of things that we appreciate in heart disease, but particularly, well, not particularly, but also in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, so if what we do know is that high levels of mTOR stimulate this lack of autophagy. And right. so if you can inhibit mTOR, um, then that's going to help with a whole myriad of these dysfunctions that we see at the cellular level yeah. uh, in, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Wow. And again, this is what Josh was, was looking at. Um, and he used two different doses in the cats um, where he tried this. And he found that the actual lower dose, and I think it was 0.3, but I might be wrong on that meets per gig, mm. uh, once every seven days, very preliminary, but gave better outcomes than a higher dose. And that's because mTOR comes in two versions, mTOR1 and mTOR2, and the mTOR2 may have worse effects in that it in predominantly is associated with the whole glucose intolerance right, side okay. of things, whereas mTOR1 is more active in the autophagy and hypertrophy. And so over a six-month period, um, what was shown in cats was that there was a, I have to say mild, and we're talking fractions of a millimeter, if we're going to be honest here, so yeah, it's yeah, 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 preliminary yeah. data. So that over six months, a it was pretty well tolerated. There were very few side effects, but um, we, there was a sustained reduction in left ventricular wall thickness over that six-month period in the lower dose rapamycin compared to the higher dose rapamycin right. compared to placebo, suggesting that um, acting primarily or uh, targeting the mTOR one appeared to be the, giving the best option, and so you know. We know that there was a very small reduction in wall thickness, and we're talking fractions of millimeters. And this appeared to be sustained over the six months when this was given. The cats tolerated it well. What effect it was having on long term survival, we don't know. What effect it was having on you know, congestive heart failure, we don't know. These were subclinical cats, like sure. you mentioned. Yeah. What effect it was having on sudden cardiac death. I mean, all this is it's a great start but it's potential means, isn't yeah, it yeah yeah. yeah yeah and and and, and they need that for all their yeah approval and all that stuff they need pilot data they need proof of concepts is a great start yeah something that you mentioned that is incredibly exciting is you mentioned a tablet every seven days owner compliance is a ginormous problem that. so that's yeah. very very cool yeah, that the frequency of administration yeah, yeah. is just yeah, is a, yeah a new formulation which was slow release from what i understand yeah. that yeah. Was, was doing the business cool. really interesting cool, cool. So wild card? Wild card. Go for it. Going to throw it out there. I think SGLT2 inhibitors. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, you yeah, see, yeah, I was yeah, going to yeah, ask yeah, you yeah. about that. Because yeah. <laughs> there's a new one on the market, obviously, isn't there? Licensed, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, absolutely. You yeah. know, and, and it's super interesting that I mean, there's we, a drug there that we could potentially reach for. Precisely. Because, you know, where we think It's a trial, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, absolutely. Yeah. And we think about the myosin inhibitors, you know. We, even if we ever did get hands on them, it's going to be so expensive. Yeah, exactly. oh, I mean, yeah, it's not yeah. going to, you know, we have to yeah. be, be realistic here. Yeah. SGLT2 inhibitors, so these are the new sexy diuretics in inverted commas, um, because frankly, most, probably most of their beneficial actions are in, a, in addition to some of the actions on the proximal convoluted tuber with the whole glucose thing, right. are going to be non diuretic. And again, I'm going to say my favorite word, they, affect autophagy yeah they go straight in on two ways they actually do inhibit mTOR so they're doing a similar thing to so rapamycin same pathway, but different way in, in yeah. addition they've also got other pathways which they directly stimulate non-hibiting directly stimulate some other pathways which again directly action um, autophagy and stimulate it and so they're probably possibly more powerful than right. um, mTOR inhibitors alone because they're doing two things and so again, they'll be then targeting the ability to prevent the mitochondrial damage, which we know causes energy dysfunction in HCM, which leads to further apoptosis, which leads to death, which leads to fibrosis, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so, you know, that's the wild card out there that wow. could 
essentially. And this again, we know we, we've, there's some interesting data looking at their use in um, rodent models into which um, myosin binding protein C3 mutations have been placed. Right. So this isn't mm -hmm. complete pie in the sky from Connolly. Is no, it? This, this is our <laughs> mutation, right? This is our <laughs> mutation. Um, and that certainly showed some um, interesting results where cool. they show reduction in autophagy. And they've also been used um, at a cellular level. Um, so looking at induced pluripotent stem cells, so where you can use these stem cells, which you can grow into cardiomyocytes. Yeah. But you can, you, again, you put in mutations into these stem yeah. cells. And again, at myosin binding protein C3 mutations, they have shown that in these stem cells, which remember, don't have a kidney, so they're not interested in yeah, the diuretic sure, effect. No, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there are no kidneys there. Nothing about urine production. Um, again, they can show at the cellular level that you can reduce hypertrophy, you can reduce, um, because in the mutated cells, they do hypertrophy, they get bigger, yeah. and you can reduce all that through the same mechanisms yeah. that we're talking about. So I think yeah. there's huge potential. So there's hope in the oh, next 10 years. Potentially, yeah. Years. I mean, yes. then there's the whole argument. Yeah. When would you introduce a potential diuretic in a cat which is asymptomatic and not, you know, there's a whole lot of other stuff yeah. that needs to be thought about. But, yeah. you know, a big part of the action of these SGLT2 inhibitors is not the diuretic effect. Um, and, you know, and they've shown that in a lot of human trials where they've been cool. doing things they cool. weren't expecting to be doing beyond the diuresis. Yeah. yeah. So I think they're fascinating drugs right. and really a huge outcome there. Yeah. And I think we're just beginning to understand them. Yeah, and you know, yeah. we're only just beginning to understand uh, what their multiple roles and functions are. Um, but I think they, they'd be a wild card for you. Really? Fantastic. Really? Really? David, thank you so much. Uh, a glimpse of the future and a nice bit of hope for, uh, for these cats and cubs. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, you so much. Great thank you. So now we're very pleased to welcome Professor Michele Borgarelli from the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine to join us on the Animal Heartbeat. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Oh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. We've been enjoying your talk this morning, um, and uh, we wanted to talk to you about the Look Mitral Registry. Exactly. You present some very interesting data on this ginormous uh, mitral valve registry that you have built up a few years back. Could you tell us, Michele, what are the main technical messages from the most recent analyses you have done on the Look data? I think the main message coming from the look micro at this point, and this uh, preliminary data obviously, is that first of all, it's confirming that mitral valve disease in dogs has a long natural history uh, with a low morbidity and mortality, uh, at least for a large group of dogs. Uh, so when we look at the preclinical dogs with my mild remodeling, we are looking at more than 70% of the dogs still alive after 77 years. That's significant, important. That's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. And I think it's confirming what we probably had an idea in the sure. past, but definitely is something that is confirmed in, in the real world population. So and, that's, is, that's the point. And on a huge scale, these 6,000 dogs you know, uh, over a long period of time, it's fantastic data. Yeah, absolutely. And we are also excited that I think Nobody ever look at the comorbidities effect on survival. Right. And the first time, I think our study is going to show that comorbidities are playing a big role in the, in the outcome for this dog, particularly the respiratory disease and presence of cancer that obviously, you know, you expect cancer shortening your life. Sure. Uh, but the respiratory disease, especially chronic bronchial disease, was quite an unexpected finding. Did, did I get it right from the data? that around 30% of the mitral valve disease dogs eventually died of mitral valve disease, meaning that, as you were saying, a lot of comorbidities will play a huge role on survival. Is that right? Yeah, it is right. And, um, and so, and, and it is another interesting aspect uh, that will probably switch our role as a cardiologist in trying to identify patient higher risk. We usually do just blood work, you know, to check is the UN or the creatinine high sure. after giving furosemide. And now we know that we need probably to do a little bit more cooperative work with internists to see what is going on, because this can play definitely a role. And how important was renal insufficiency as a comorbidity in your mitral dogs? That's an interesting point. It's played some roles. 
but probably much less important than what we thought. And I think this is coming from literature too. If you look at the literature, sure. the, the prevalence of renal failure or azotemia in dogs with mitral valve disease is relatively low. Even in dogs that are more advanced, like stage C dogs. And our data confirmed that. I mean, so only 4% of dogs uh, with, uh, of this study, they have renal failure recorded in the medical record. Now, you remember that this is not a perfect world, so you, we have to rely what is in the medical record, interpreting the medical record. So maybe it will be like higher, but still it's very low. I mean. The other thing also interesting was blood pressure, uh, because we always talk about blood pressure, the effect of blood pressure, of blood pressure on, on mitral valve disease progression. And that you show that blood pressure in your multivariable analysis model was an independent predictor of all cause mortality, right? Yeah. Um, so does that mean that we should measure blood pressure? That's something that I've been advocated for years. I don't understand why in veteran medicine, with the technique that we have right now, we don't measure blood pressure, especially in patients where we give drugs that we expect to decrease or increase blood pressure, or the may blood pressure may be a, a, a big role. I mean, uh, so I, I definitely believe that. Yes, our study suggests that it's probably the time that we also start, start measure. to measure it. <laughs> <laughs> Reach for the Doppler unit yeah. for the SNM X-ray. What's next? So what can we expect from the look registry okay. data? So for the look mitral, we, we're planning now probably to have several papers coming out because we cannot fit everything in one single paper. And uh, I, I think that the two most interesting part for what is the future plans are. Number one, we probably analyze a little bit more carefully the pre-symptomatic population uh, because that is, a pop that is a part of the study that really can tell us what is the natural history of the disease hmm. more than just when they are in our failure. I think the other aspect would be treatment effect. Um, obviously, we have a bunch of dogs that were enrolled before Pinobenda. Right. was commonly prescribed in B2. So we had the opportunity, and I think there are about 300 dogs in that. Right. So we have the opportunity for the first time to, to assess if there is any effective treatment. Uh, we need still to work a lot because we need to be careful. Obviously, this is not a control for our study. Yeah, so it must it's, be very hard to standardize that. If but can. We, we, we work with a good statistician, Ken Olamp, that is great. It's very enthusiastic, and he has expertise in uh, AI learning machine, so we probably start to, to use the uh, machine learning models to develop that. So hopefully by the end of the next year we have more data coming on this. Fantastic yeah, stuff. Very exciting. And again, thanks very much for building this disease registry, which is quite unique in the veterinary world and will give us such valuable data in the future. Thank really. you for inviting me. I yeah. really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. We have here with us Professor Tony Glaus, Professor of Veterinary Cardiology at the University of Zurich. Tony, it's great to have you with, with us today. We'll be talking about pulmonary hypertension. Thanks for joining us, Tony. We wanted to talk around the topic of pulmonary hypertension. What, what's the point of diagnosing pulmonary hypertension? Why is it so important to us? Yeah, thank you very much that I can be here. And exactly that would be my first question. Everybody now talks about diagnosing pulmonary hypertension, and then my question is, why do we want to diagnose from hypertension? And I have here a list of some points why I believe, why we want to diagnose it and, and how we diagnose it. So the first thing is nowadays, because we are really very, very sensitive for, for this disease. No, no, not for this disease, for this we call it syndrome. How do yeah. you call it? Because we discussed that we discussed before. We discussed this. We how have this conversation. It? Because yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah. syndrome. No, you, you see, very honestly, yeah. nowadays, how I would call it, I would call it nowadays, it's a, it's a laboratory abnormality. You know? Yeah, I, think yes. I always tell say that anemia, yeah, yeah, anemia yeah, yeah. is not a yeah. diagnosis. Yeah, exactly. Diarrhea yeah. is not a diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. hypertension is not a diagnosis. Yes. And, right. and, and so people want to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. And so, again, why do I want to do this? So, one important thing is I have a dog with clinical signs. And I do a really focused exam because I do have pulmonary hypertension on my list. Um, so that is one reason why I want to diagnose it and then find out, do I really have it? And is it hemodynamically relevant? Sometimes I may do an echo and it's actually an incidental finding. Sure. So, and then, or I do have an underlying disease. I know this dog has much valve disease. And nowadays, all of us do echo on much valve disease. And then, and then say, and this dog has already pulmonary hypertension because that's probably one of the most common 
causes of pulmonary hypertension. So that's another thing. So we know we have much about this, and I want to know does this dog also have pulmonary hypertension? And there, I'm already getting a little bit nervous because people love, they love to diagnose pulmonary hypertension, much of disease. And again, then I ask the same question, is it relevant? Is it hemodynamically relevant? Is it relevant for the dog? Is it therapeutically relevant? Just yeah. to mention it. But the point is, one reason to, to want to diagnose pulmonary hypertension is because I know the dog has much valve disease. In the early days of pulmonary hypertension, why I want to know it is I have a suspicion of pulmonary thromboembolism. And then to know if this is hemodynamically relevant pulmonary thromboembolism, again, a little bit similar to before, I want to, I want to see do I have pulmonary hypertension. I thought a lot about this also sort of hypoxia. I mentioned IHA as a potential disease causing pulmonary thromboembolism. Another one is pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis, a disease that may cause pulmonary thromboembolism. As there again, um, I don't want to lose my dog in the end with pancreatitis dying of pulmonary thromboembolism. So that's again a reason why. I would like to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. And do you think the same is true for the protein-losing nephropathies, the protein-losing enteropathies? They're less acute. They might, I guess they might present with a PTE rather than presenting for the protein loss initially. Is that something you, you see? That's a very good question. I mean, I would probably turn the question around or, or the issue around. The point is, when I have a strong suspicion of pulmonary thromboembolism, let's say because hemodynamically the dog is sick, sure. I do an echo and a pulmonary thromboembolism, then I ask myself, what are causes of pulmonary thromboembolism? And I, to this issue, I come afterwards again, because that is for me much more important than to diagnose pulmonary hypertension, so to find the cause. So, the, so to get back to your question, so if I find pulmonary thromboembolism that I consider hemodynamically significant, yeah. I go through my groups of causes of pulmonary hypertension, Hypertension, and then yeah. obviously one of them is pulmonary thromboembolism. And then if I draw the drawer pulmonary thromboembolism, then I come with what I already said, IHA, easy, easy to rule out, obviously. Pancreatitis, more or less easy to get there. Yeah. Neoplasia, protein-losing nephropathy, protein-losing endropathy, hyperadrenocorticism, we always have it on our list. I really don't know how often we do see pulmonary thromboembolism. So I go through the list of all causes to find out what is the cause of the suspected pulmonary thromboembolism, which I jumped on because I found pulmonary hypertension on my echo. Okay. You, you mentioned their hypoxia. So you did a lot of work on high altitude and so on uh, in the past. Is hypoxia really important clinically? Do we see hypoxia as the trigger of pulmonary hypertension in dogs or cats? Again, this is a lovely question, and I thought so much about it and there are papers about it, hypoxia. So if we talk hypoxia, let's take human medicine. In human medicine, sleep apnea is a very important syndrome, and these people have chronic hypoxia, and they develop severe pulmonary hypertension with right-sided heart failure. Oh, yeah. This seems to be a really important disease. In veterinary medicine, we see a lot of upper airway disease. We see the brachycephalic dogs that are really having narrow airways, and I have looked at those, never published, some people did, and hardly ever find hemodynamically relevant pulmonary hypertension yeah, in these yeah, dogs. Yeah. The other group is tracheal collapse. We have dogs with severe tracheal collapse, chronic with dyspnea. They hardly ever have pulmonary hypertension. And the yeah. point probably there is that they, they do not have chronic hypoxia. I mean, they have their episodes, their crises, but in between not. And, and most apparently, you, you have to have constantly or for hours in a row hypoxia to really get pulmonary hypertension. And, and if you talk hypoxia, I would la love to talk about numbers because, as you know, I did some stuff on high altitude to see how important is hypoxia for pulmonary hypertension. So we went on the Swiss mountains. We, we measured blood gas at 2,300 meters and, and pulmonary hypertension based on tricuspid regurg, and we went up to 3,600 meters. Oh. And they had, they had increased peak velocity of of VMAX uh, at 2,300, and they had mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension, rather mild than moderate, but just about in this area, at 3,600 meters um, above sea level. Um, and, and now I come to the point, at 2,300 meters, a arterial oxygen concentration is around, around 60 millimeters of mercury. 
and at 3,600 meters, they have an oxygen of about 50 millimeters, merc millimeters of mercury, meaning that is a quite significant or quite marked hypoxia. Yeah. And these dogs are completely asymptomatic up there. Okay, they have, as I said, mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension. And another thing that I really think is very important, they do not develop polycythemia. Oh, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, and, and I will get to the point why this is interesting for us cardiologists. So the yeah. point is, now you could argue if they are not the whole day at 3,600 meters, but only from, let's say, 9 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the afternoon, so they have eight hours of hypoxia, quite significant hypoxia, 55, 50 millimeters of mercury. Maybe eight hours per day is not enough, which I, I, I doubt if this is true. In a person, or, it would be enough, wouldn't it? I'm not so sure. And i I give you another example. I was just very recently in Bolivia, La Paz. People there live at 4,000 meters above, above sea level, and obviously they have more often um, arterial hypertension. But yeah. for example, my, my daughter was there, and they do not get polycythemia. Okay, so but not one percent at 3,600 meters. So either it's not long enough, or 50 millimeters of mercury is not low enough. And now I get to my cardiology yeah. point. If we have dogs. With Eisenmenger physiology, Eisenmenger syndrome, mm -hmm. some of them get severely polycythemic and some of them do not get polycythemic. And there I got the impression that you probably need, also based on my high altitude things, it must be significantly below 50. I would postulate your PaO2 going to the kidney must be 40 millimeters of mercury or less to actually really get clinically relevant polycythemia. So you really need a lot of hypoxia to get polycythemic. And so just to mention these numbers, I feel like they help you to understand why dogs with right to left jumps, some dogs do not be right. polycythemia. And this is, I guess, you all see that. Some get severely polycythemic, yeah. others don't. But it's interesting because we look at the packed cell volume as an indicator of severity. But I guess based on what you're saying, it has to be very severe before it starts to drive PCB into the 70s. Exactly. It, to drive the PC into the 70s and that they get clinical, it, it, it must be very severe. I repeat mm. my Bolivia thing. I mean, I've been there. I mean, nobody faints up there. There is no <laughs> seizure, seizures yeah. happening in, in the streets. And, and I'm sure they have a PAO2 probably of about 45. Wow. You can take a physiology book, you know, and look. I mean, you can actually, we measured it, but you can take an old physiology book where you see that um, oxygen dissociation curve uh, uh, to, to see at, at, at what how shall I say, at what altitude you have what PaO2, and then at what PaO2 you have what oxygen saturation. And to come back to my high altitude dogs, at, at 2,300 meters with their 60 millimeters of mercury PaO2, they had a saturation of 91%. And the ones at, at 3,600 meters above sea level in the PaO2 of 50 millimeters of mercury, they had a saturation of about 89 Again, if you take a physiology book, it's, it's all there. We just we are not so much aware of it if we don't measure it and look at it. Yeah, but the, yeah. So then my point is, if you are at around a 90% saturation, you will not be very clinical and you will not get polycythemic. If we step it back to the, the dogs with severe respiratory disease and pulmonary hypertension, we think of the group three dogs with respiratory disease associated with pulmonary hypertension. And... In the consensus statement from ACBIM, they talk about chronic airway disease, chronic bronchitis, uh, or bronchomalacia, depending on what you want to say, tracheal collapse, interstitial fibrosis. I, I think I feel like the dogs with interstitial fibrosis, that's very bad. I, we see pulmonary hypertension, but I don't think we see it with the other diseases that are mentioned there. Is that I, How do you feel that about is that? Exactly, is that, that, except, that? That is exactly my perception. With interstitial lung disease, let's face it, with Westies, yeah. we, particularly we see it, at, and it's really end stage. And that yes, it, it's yeah, hemodynamically yeah. relevant that we, in the echo, do not only just see some tricuspid regurgitation of a certain peak velocity, but also that the left ventricle gets a little bit underloaded and, and, and starts to get congested on the right. Where I also have seen it is in dogs that got radiation of the chest, I guess, for some car cardiac tumors. You've mentioned this before. And, yeah. And then they develop also kind of pulmonary fibrosis. And there you can really follow the dogs. Uh, how shall I say? Process of no return once it starts. So yeah. you can follow these dogs. They really get hypoxic. And I have to say that 
the ones I have seen, their problem was not the pulmonary hypertension, their problem was really the hypoxia. They uh -huh. really had shortness of breath and not so much hemodynamic compromise. You see people do, take a Westy, do an echo with pulmonary fibrosis, here's pulmonary hypertension, and they put him on sildenafil. And they almost, my, my point is, what is the dog's clinical problem? Is the dog's clinical problem forward flow or backward congestion? And then obviously sildenafil would be a smart choice. Or is the dog's problem dyspnea? And then the only reason why sildenafil may help in dyspnea is if they have some peripheral shunts, you know, which you may occlude with sildenafil. The shunts that Matos published 15 <laughs> years, ago, years ago, was it really relevant or not? But my point is, that's where I see sildenafil might help the Wesley with dyspnea because the, the main if, if effect of, of sildenafil is, is to, to counteract pulmonary hypertension. It's not going to give him much more oxygen, just to mention it, okay? Right. Um, so then can we say... I want to stay quickly with yeah, tracheal yeah. because we, we, I mean, all of us, we, we did a sequence of every tracheal collapse gets an echo and, and they have never pulmonary hypertension. I wanted also to, to touch this point. For me, the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is not a challenge. It's not a challenge. The challenge for me is what causes it. And if I have such a case and in the end we lose it and he, he dies or is euthanized, I go myself to necropsy to see what caused this severe pulmonary hypertension. And so often we are frustrated that we do not find any Sure. These are pathological yeah, yeah. lesions, well, really. Yeah. And, yeah. and then to get back to the tracheal colours, and then you have dogs, you don't have a video here, but they really have a tracheal like this. A horrible tracheal like this, where right. I, can, I have to say, Completely I mean, collapsed. if yeah. he has a yeah, tracheal like this, he did really not get any more oxygen. And, and if that's the only thing I find, then I guess, yeah, maybe in this dog it was really purely hypoxic pulmonary hypertension. Okay, but, but if I look at clinical... Uh, Tracheal collapse cases, I take 100 tracheal collapse cases, maybe I find one with, I repeat myself, hemodynamically relevant pulmonary hypertension. Right. If I find just a TR Vmax of 3.5 and right. nothing else, or some pulmonary artery distensibility, who cares? Yeah. Who cares? So to be severe, we need severe diffuse lung lesions, because we, when do we see severe lungworm infection? Pulmonary fibrosis the pause radiation that you said. So we need chronicity and very severe lung lesions, right? Yeah, changes. yeah, I mean, Credit I'll give severe, another example. Yeah. If, if I need a lung, and Jose, you will give me half of your lung, <laughs> and and we both and have half a lung, it, though, yeah. and <laughs> we have both will not develop pulmonary hypertension yeah, exactly. right. with yeah. half a lung. So yeah. the point is, you need lung disease where you have less than, yeah. where you yeah. more yeah. than 50%. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and it must be chronic because you can have a severe yeah. pneumonia. The dog is, is really hypoxic. I mean, so yeah. that apparently that's not good enough. So yeah, yeah we mentioned these essential lung disease, which is really chronic and bad. And the, the tough thing there is on radiographs, you, you cannot even appreciate so much the oh, lung yeah. lesions. You, yeah. you need actually a lung yeah. CT to say, oh yeah, these lungs are and really, really then, very I've sick. I've seen cases where the CT, the images say, we have done the slice thickness right, everything's right, there's no fibrosis. And on necropsy, fibrosis. Uh, you know, it's hard. That is to really, those. yeah, that's, that's really tough. And n nowadays, our histopathologists are more are more sensitive because we, we really sit in their neck and say, hey, come on, you must find something. <laughs> and, and then first day, they kind of you know, try, try to, to <laughs> interpret something. And then now, what they do now, they take age-matched control dogs yeah, right, and yeah. look at histopathology and then they compare oh, wow. and they show it to me. And then I say, because before we said, yeah, yeah, the pathologists, they do a bad job. And then they do a brilliant job. And then I say, I don't see a difference. Right. I don't mm -hmm. see a difference in pulmonary right. artery wall thickness. I don't see a difference in the interstitial spaces. And I don't see it. So, and then yeah. I, I then ask myself, is this is so much just functional? Because, they, I mean, if they have severe pulmonary hypertension on, on echo, I mean, that, that doesn't lie. You know, right. it, it, it doesn't lie. If, if your left ventricle is, is empty and the right side is, is volume overloaded, congested liver veins, and, and then you measure, in addition, your tricuspid regurg, and you have 100 millimeters of mercury. There is no doubt there is severe pulmonary hypertension. You don't find anything in the lungs either. Either we just miss it. But then again, I have to say, if you need more than half the lungs destroyed to actually get yeah. pulmonary hypertension, how, how can it? you miss it? Sure. How can you miss yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. So then I ask myself, it's functional. Is it functional? And if it is functional, in these diseases, okay, then I guess it would be a good choice to treat. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Cool. Final question.
What would be a game changer? What do you think that would be, would you like to see in pulmonary hypertension, diagnosis, treatment? What would make your life as a clinician researcher easier maybe? I already mentioned it a little bit before. My biggest concern now is not to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. And I, I really do not care based on what you diagnose it. First of all, I want to know if it's hemodynamically relevant. But my problem is, what is the cause of the pulmonary hypertension? So if, if not even with necropsy, when I really can look at the whole dog, not even at necropsy, if I find a convincing um, explanation. That's really my biggest frustration. So I don't know the answer to your question, but my question is, how can we better diagnose histologically pulmonary hypertension? Do we need special stains? Do we need maybe, in, I mean, in people they do, in life people they do, functional studies to, to see how they respond yeah, to certain yeah. drugs, mm -hmm. okay? Again, not really towards diagnosis. I really would like to get better in diagnosing the cause of pulmonary hypertension. That's really where I would put my focus now um, by talking to human specialized pathologists. Because if you do not know what causes it, it makes it so difficult to treat it. Right. Okay, yeah. and then one subgroup we talked about is pulmonary thromboembolism. When we started to have angio-CT, I thought, great, now we can diagnose pulmonary thromboembolism. Yeah. And we, it, we cannot, yeah. we cannot. Yeah. So, so then we, we, then we have, oh, it could be pulmonary thromboembolism, then we treat them a little bit antithrombotic, maybe not too severe because we are afraid, because we are not even able to diagnose sure. pulmonary yeah. thromboembolism. Yeah. My primary focus, well, our focus should really be to, to diagnose pathophysiologic co correctly and, and, and ideally the underlying cause of the pulmonary hypertension. That is really where I think our focus should be placed yeah. um, and, and I have no vision um, where it's going, to be very honest. Yeah, but I think, I think the vision for better, more reliable, more accurate diagnostics to understand it, so we know what we're treating, is a good vision. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Great. Tony, very good as always. Yeah, uh, thanks thank so you much. very much for joining us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cheers. So next we're honored to have Professor Joe Dukes McEwen from the University of Liverpool Small Animal Teaching Hospital to speak to us on the topic of dilated cardinality. Welcome, Joe. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Joe. And uh dilated cardiomyopathy, you just gave us a nice talk about echocardiography guidelines mm -hmm. and uh, what are what what are your top diagnostic tips uh, echocardiographic diagnostic tips to diagnose dilated cardiomyopathy in dogs yeah so so i guess the first thing is dilated cardiomyopathy is a diagnosis of exclusion mm -hmm. so so not just excluding other structural or functional heart disease but obviously the diet history the um any history suggests of myocarditis. So we, before we can safely diagnose dilated cardiomyopathy, we have to actively exclude those things. Um, from the echocardiography, I guess I use a variety of things. So I don't just do M mode and rely on M mode, but I will, I will use the Simpson's method of discs, usually from the right parasternal view, because I, in my hands that seems to optimize left ventricular length an area. It's reassuring to hear that because I think for most of us too, we yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Same thing, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think the morphology or the somatotype of the dog. So in Doberman, you might get a good, a similar volume from the left atrial view, but if it's a Newfoundland, which is my PhD and postdoc stuff, right. then absolutely no way you're going to optimize <laughs> or you're going to be anywhere near the apex. Right. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so the volumes, the end systolic volume index, I guess, is a really important thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the M modes I still do. I like M modes um, probably because I'm older and more old fashioned maybe, <laughs> but I still like them. But I won't make a diagnosis based on a fractional shortening measurement. Yeah, I sure. think I think if something has genuinely got systolic dysfunction, whatever the fractional shortening says, the systolic diameter and the end systolic volume index will be increased. So yeah. people treating fractional shortenings of 17%, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it, if the heart's not dilated, that dog doesn't need pyrimidine, and breeds like Dobermans have got much better apicobasilar contractility or longitudinal contractility sure. than their radials. So they often have fractional shortens around twenty percent. So I think we have to go on the altered geometry, and if you've really got systolic dysfunction, your systolic variables will be increased. You you describe sphericity index, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pioneering paper, uh, yeah. well, the very first. Paper on guidelines on, on diagnosis of yeah. echocardiography. Do you still use sphericity in, in this? In this? 
sphericity I, I, index? I, yes, sphericity index. So, so basically that is a ratio of the left ventricular length. So we get that measurement when we're doing our CUCs left of disc, so the length as well as the, the, the area and volume. Yeah. Um, and I usually can, um, divide that by my M mode width. I'm obviously can measure it on 2D mm -hmm. as well, but I've, got, I've generated the M mode values in yeah. diastolic. So I do use it. Um, obviously, people like Gerhard Best have shown that actually it wasn't very sensitive or specific. But I think that's because of the difficulty getting the left ventricular um, apex in and optimizing left ventricular length. So I, I like it. I like the way you can quantify the altered geometry by using it. Right. But it probably isn't a good cut off for saying this dog has DCM versus this dog hasn't. It's attractive, isn't it? Because it puts a numerical value on a completely subjective assessment otherwise. Yes, yeah. And I, I can't think of anything else that does that in the same way. Mm. No, absolutely. And I, th I think the one thing that we still need to know are different somatotypes of dogs tend to have little squat ventricles. Um, right. So I suppose things like Shih Tzus and Lazars, they're probably not going to get DCM, but, but they tend to have little squat ventricles and their spricity index probably is about 1.3, 1.4. So, um, whereas if you're a Doberman, you're almost a, a proper ellipse, you know, your length is twice or even greater than twice as long yeah. as your, your width of the ventricle. So I think, it, I think we need reference ranges if we're going to do it, probably, but, but certainly when I'm, the breeds I'm familiar with dealing with, the DCM screening like Dobermans and Newfoundlands and Great Danes, yeah. then, then I think it, it helps me. Right. But it doesn't, it's not, I don't think it is a major diagnostic criteria. Injection fraction is such an important variable in, in humans mm -hmm. and relates so well with outcome and so yeah. on. And we tend to look at the volumes, and diastolic volume mm. and in systolic volume, but we don't necessarily speak about injection fraction. Do you ever look at injection fraction or you rely no, on I, No, I do, yeah. I do yeah. use the ejection okay. fraction. But again, if we have kind of very asynchronous wall motion, yeah. um, then, then it could be falsely low. Um, I think uh, even some normal dogs, it might be only about 50%. Mm. Um, or possibly lower, and I think some of the cutoffs, like for our Great Danes, the cutoff was somewhere in the forty yeah. percent. Right. So, so to be abnormal, you have to be quite a lot lower than that. But yes, I mean, I will look at all of this, and I always do use a scoring system. You know, having actively excluded other reasons, you can get a similar dilated globular heart phenotype. So you talked about it being a diagnosis of exclusion, mm -hmm. and I think you know, we always think about, could it be an old myocarditis, or, or a current mm -hmm. myocarditis that's mm -hmm. got ventricular arrhythmias, or mm -hmm. a small pericardial effusion, or you know, any of these yeah. you know, rigors. In the human literature, they identify dysynchrony as being a huge primary driving force mm. for myocardial and one of course, mm -hmm. of function. Do you think we ever see that again? I suppose we, we, we often see a mild dyssynchrony, but, but not really severe dysynchrony, which I guess in people is more likely to be due to coronary artery disease and myocardial sure. ischemia, stroke fibrosis. So yes, we have fibrosis, but it's more mixed rather than focal yeah. in, in the dog with DCM anyway. Cats might be different, obviously. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 the dog, um, myocarditis is an exclusion criterion, um, but we, I guess, tend to be non-aggressive in chasing the causes. So we might do a 4DX snap test to right. make sure there's no Borrelia or anything else, or rely on the troponin. So a DCM will have an increased troponin, but if it's 180 on an right. imilite assay, then it's probably, you need to be looking for reasons for that. Yeah. So we, we will use biomarkers, well certainly troponin as a sort of additional prognostic variable. Yeah, great. Right. Final question, what's the future? What would you like to see <laughs> happening in dilated cardiomyopathy, or what do you foresee that could happen and could help us either diagnosing or treating dilated cardiomyopathy in dogs? I, th I think the difficulty in diagnosing is, is obviously it's a continuum. So those of us involved in screening dilated cardiomyopathy, we can have a lot of equivocal dogs that we think, I don't know, is that going to progress or not? And people, ne breeders, vets, owners, us, we don't like this equivocal criteria, but you're not going to be normal today and then wake up with ECM tomorrow. It is a right. continuum. So there's got to be this, this gray scale. And I'd love to be able to define that better. Um, so kind of looking at things like speckle tracking echo or looking at sort of novel echo techniques, but I think it's really difficult.
I suppose at this Congress, we had a presentation this morning, didn't we, about Meg's Leaper about doing um, gene therapy in, in dogs with DCM, but it wasn't the gene therapy that fixes the problem in the same way as right. has been described with, say, some of the uh, muscular dystrophies. Sure. But uh, it's sort of more treating the consequences of the DCM, like calcium cycling yeah. um, that, that she talked about. But yes, I think that's uh, watch this space. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? Gene therapy, because I, I guess we think of gene therapy as aiming to be curative. Yes. But if it's part of the management strategy, yes, that's, that's an interesting angle. It is an interesting that. angle, yeah. which we hadn't, I hadn't really thought of no. until she was she was speaking about that as well. Um, and, and I suppose the other thing that, um, again, going back um, to the early 2000s, when I was sort of finishing my PhD and doing a postdoc in Newfoundland DCM, we use linkage analysis to try and find um, a locus associated with it. We thought it should be looking at the pedigree analysis. We thought be, this is nice and simple. Yeah. It's a single gene disorder. It's autosomal dominant. We'll find it. I'll get my Nobel Prize because at the, <laughs> <That's> because, <it. laughs> because at the time because at the time nothing was really yeah. known. And then right. since then, you know, where genes have to, like obviously Kate Muir's group has described striatin in boxes with ARVC and PDK4 and titan in Dobermans. But it just isn't a single gene I, disorder. It's just I think, so complex. I, th I think what we thought was simple, um, and you thought a breed is a closed dog population, they've got to have the same gene. You know, Dobermans, they're so narrow um, as, as a sort of a closed breed. It's, you know, how can you have so many different causes? And what looks like DCM, identical DCM in, in a Doberman, they all look the same, um, whether it's a tighty mutation or not. And I think there's just more to find. So I think what we thought was simple, and I thought would be simple, um, has just not proved proved to be, and I would love to elucidate more of that and understand it better. I feel so much better because before my PhD, I was also convinced you're going to get a Nobel Prize. Prize no, 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 I'm not smart enough. No, 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 no but there were no really known gene defects. Right. And so I thought, oh, we'll get it in the Newfoundlands and then the world. But, yeah. <laughs> sadly, <laughs> but sadly not. Really. It's interesting, isn't it, how these genetic work that goes on in these obscure diseases. Yes. Like, like uh, uh, Anne Christine. Um, Mervé. Mervé. Yes. At Liège. And uh, as part of her work with Lupa, found the um, genetic mutation associated with ciliary dyskinesia, dyskinesia in old, in the old English 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 English. Yes. And then they looked for it in people and they found it in people. And yes. Oh, okay. That's what you want to target in humans. And that was just, that was a roll of the dice, wasn't it? They <laughs> yeah. just went right. I mean, but that's, that, 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 yeah. that's, yeah. that's, that's your, that's, that's what research. you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you're either lucky or not. Yeah. 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 I wasn't lucky. But, but yes, I think the Looper project, again, was really set out more for single gene disorders. Sure. Um, so yeah. things like Great Danes and Newfoundlands, None of a few loci looked interesting, but none reached statistical significance. Really so, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Jay, yeah. Thanks so much. Pleasure. That's no, that's that's not great. It's been nice much. to chat to you both, and I admire the podcast. So, oh, thank yeah. you. Very thank, kind. thank you yeah. very much. We're very pleased now to have our next guest, Dr. Jessica Ward from Iowa State University, joining us. Uh, welcome, Jess. Thanks for coming as a guest. Thanks so much for having me, Kieran. Jessica, thanks so much for joining us today. What's the evidence at the moment for ROS inhibition? When and should we do it? At which stage? In which diseases? There's been a lot of confusion over the years about RAS inhibition, what drug to use, when to start, and a lot of conflicting evidence. Right. To set that stage, I think a lot of the issue is that for many years we didn't really know how to measure RAS endpoints to say what our drugs were doing on the RAS. A lot of the initial work that was done, for example, that established the dose of benazepril that's used in Europe, was done using endpoints for the RAS that were not particularly physiologically useful, like okay. just ACE activity in vitro. And we now have the ability to characterize an entire RAS fingerprint, all of the angiotensin peptides from the classical and alternative RAS, at one time from a single serum sample. Therefore, our knowledge of how to measure the RAS has grown so much that we have to retrospectively look at some of those studies in a little bit different light and think about what they really mean. My interpretation of the studies in stage B2, so that would be 
the VetProof study and the SVET study are that they were looking at two slightly different populations of dogs, obviously the SVET study with Cavaliers only yeah, sure. in Scandinavia. The dose of ACE inhibitor that was used in that study was about 0.33 mg per kg mm -hmm. per day of enalapril, and then that proved slightly higher, 4 to saying these numbers off the cuff here, but yeah, sure. um, per day, around that level. Around that level. Yeah. And most of what we currently use now in the ACVIM world um, in North America is more along the lines of the ACVIM consensus statement at 0.5 mg per kg twice a day, right. so quite a bit higher. So part of the hypothesis for some of my work has been, and the work of my team, is that some of the previous studies that didn't show as much benefit might be related to the dose not optimizing our inhibition of the RAS. Some of our recent work has shown using mathematical modeling and some experimental trials, dose response trials in beagles, that we do get progressive and better inhibition of classical RAS metabolites and upregulation of alternative RAS metabolites with the higher doses, right. with 0.5 mg per kg twice a day being the best of the doses that we are testing and modeling. So for me, I'm convinced enough by the, I guess maybe soft findings of that proof that there was a non-statistically significant trend toward an improved outcome in stage B2 for enalapril at the slightly higher dose that I do use ACE inhibitors either enalapril or benazepril in stage B2 routinely. I start them at the same time that I start hemobendin. From surveys and from look mitral data, I'd have to double check those, but I think that that probably reflects somewhere between a third and a half of US cardiologist practice right, with the okay. others doing hemobendin as sole therapy in stage B2. Yeah. What do you make of mm. the DLI study? I think those results are puzzling, but if you, if you look at the dose of ACE inhibitor used, it's among the lowest of any of those studies. To me, delay is more of an argument against using spironolactone in stage B2 rather than an argument against using the benazepril because if your dose is so low, it might be acting as another placebo. That's interesting. Oh, right. So, okay. so are you saying that you would only use an AC inhibitor or are you still aiming all the time to have a more holistic approach and would you use all the time spironolactone or AC inhibitor? What, what, do do? what I typically do is in B2, only the ACE inhibitor okay. because right. of the delay study oh, findings. Right. Right. But it, once they're in stage C, then I'll do quadruple therapy based on yeah. the best study findings. Sure. And so that's why I say that delay to me is more of a argument against spironolactone oh, in really B2. Interesting. But you could also make the argument based on work showing that about a third of dogs on an ACE inhibitor experience aldosterone right. breakthrough. Right. Should we just go ahead and cover those dogs with with spironolactone anytime we're using an ACE inhibitor. Truly, I don't know, and I don't think we have the data to know. In an ideal world, we would have a quick bedside test that would identify aldosterone yeah. breakthrough. Oh, this dog's aldosterone is crazy high. Okay, well, And then we would just cover stuff. them, yeah. yeah. What I think is really cool now is the good and the bad RAS, the, 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 the different <laughs> okay. pathways. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. So what we're learning more about the RAS is that in addition to what we were all, what I was taught in vet school, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, yeah, aldosterone, sure. we've got these alternative pathways mostly modulated by the enzyme ACE2, which have essentially the counteracting balancing effect. So lead to things like diuresis, naturesis, antifibrotic. So theoretically, the best outcome from the RAS that we can think of would be drugs that downregulate classical RAS and upregulate alternative RAS. Okay. And that's where some of the research is leaning. You could make that argument that angiotensin II receptor blockers might be superior to ACE inhibitors because they don't, you still have angiotensin II that is available to go down other pathways and create okay. downstream yeah, sure. alternative RAS metabolites. And then you're only blocking the receptor for the bad angiotensin II yeah. outcomes. Additionally, there are thoughts about can we exogenously give things like ACE2, angiotensin 1-7, and other alternative metabolites directly or modulate other drugs that upregulate their production. I think that's leaning towards the future. It's very exciting, but I felt like when I was doing my residency six, seven years ago, that the RAS was dead. The RAS is dead. Yeah, dead. that's what I there, thought too. And it was the vet proof, blah, 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 that's dead. There's a lot of very interesting research going on. It's a really yeah. vibrant area, isn't yeah. it? I think that. I think so. And I think it's also been interesting for me as I've gone through my career. I, I work in the U.S. I trained in the U.S., but I have a lot of European cardiology colleagues, sure. and I love the cross-collaborations. And the practices of pharmaceutical regulation really, I think, shape 
people's interpretation of studies and their okay. practices in ways that are extremely fair. In my country, my little universe, <laughs> I can prescribe any generic product that I want. I don't have to have, I, we have lots of freedom in terms of off-label, et cetera. So therefore, currently, RAS inhibition that I have access to can be as inexpensive as $4 a month or $9 for three months. Wow. It takes less evidence for me to be convinced to put a dog on an ACE inhibitor or spironolactone the because we, my threshold right. for evidence is lower. Yeah. So I totally understand an interpretation that would look at the same data and say, I need my threshold of evidence to be higher before I'm going to spend the money or ask my owner to spend the money on those drugs. I need right. to ask about the cats for this. I like here. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, we, we, we always joke that uh, there's like a drinking game. If anyone who listens to the podcast, maybe it's coffee because it's a morning thing, yeah. a podcast maybe, but people drink when Jose talks about feline cardiomyopathy like because <laughs> it's a regular thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So do you give ACE inhibitors to cats and when? Excellent question. As you know, there's basically no evidence to guide us on this, so it's yeah. all just going on clinical impression. Even it's published, it's not great it's evidence. It's not right. I shouldn't have said there's no evidence. There's published studies that I don't know. There's, there's publications and there's evidence, I think. Yes. I do give ACE inhibitors in stage C for cats because I, do, I believe that furosemide is activating the RAS to a point where I have to believe that ACE inhibitors are going to be helpful. But as you all saw me present yesterday, azotemia in cats is obviously a huge thing. Sure. Kidney injury is a huge thing. So my typical practice is I'll start an ACE inhibitor when a cat has stable renal values, but I wouldn't start if they're experiencing a kidney injury or if I don't know what On the day history one of is. Correct. Yeah, sure. okay. I often find myself waiting till the first recheck and then considering, of course, again, doing this without a lot of evidence. I don't use a lot of spironolactone in cats, I think because of the initial concerns about facial pruritus and side effects, which based on more recent studies is probably an overestimation and I'll probably start doing more spironolactone in cats. I don't typically start ACE inhibitors in B2 cats unless it's that cat that you're echoing and thinking this cat's gonna go into heart failure tomorrow because I, again, have to believe that the degree of fibrosis and remodeling is such that um, RAS is activated. But we do have some data from a study we published a couple years ago that the RAS is activated in cats with stage C compared to control cats. Right. So I, I, I believe that they, it their feels RAS logical. Is, it feels logical. But it's hard because I, I, I currently don't, don't use ACE mm -hmm. in, in cats. cats in stage C. Uh, well, or, or with B2. For me, that's about compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, cost is part of it, but ACE inhibitors are quite a lot cheaper than the combined like, mm -hmm. ACE inhibitor and spironolactone products that we have. It's always a difficult thing because I get asked by vets. What's different about cats? Mm -hmm. Well, they're probably not that different, right? It, yeah. It's just at the moment, it's hard to justify. Mm -hmm. But you're right, it must be happening. Yeah. You know, so inhibition of the RAS makes sense. And I think maybe a lot of us have two different populations of owner compliance that we're working with. The yeah. ones who are going to do whatever we say and chase their cat around the house to give the meds. And for an owner who, for example, if I'm already having them give multiple pills inside a gelatin capsule, the ACE inhibitor is tiny. It's a little fraction. It doesn't add that much. I do give ACE inhibitors once a day in cats based on pharmacokinetic data that is old, and we don't have good RAS pharmaco pharmacodynamic data for cats sure. yet. You mentioned benazepril. Mm -hmm. So there was a valve study, as everyone knows. They use a different ACE inhibitor. Does that play a role, first question? Is our ACE inhibitors different? I don't know, but I don't think that that's one of the main drivers no. of the results of valve. I explain the results of the valve study in two ways. One, again, dose of the ACE inhibitor used was quite low compared to what we typically use, sure. a quarter to an eighth of, of our typical dose. Wow, that but is a lot less. It's yeah. a lot less. And possibly more importantly, the average dose of furosemide used in valve was eight mg per kg per day as a starting dose, which is much higher than what I typically use. And the thought is, at that level of furosemide dose, I don't think any amount of ACE inhibitor is going to overcome that RAS activation. So we always have this final question, what's the next game change and so on, and here, well, it's, it's, I guess there will be a lot of stuff to say. But what would you like to see? What, what would be very exciting for you uh, in, these, in this arena? I think what would be really exciting is exploring drugs that can, again, capitalize on this mitigation where we're not just shutting off RAS completely or trying to turn off a faucet. We're being more nuanced about 
prioritizing alternative RAS metabolites and really knowing what those end outcomes are. I think that will include things like testing angiotensin receptor blockers versus ACE inhibitors, things like Intresto, um, and again, thinking about potentially giving some of these metabolites just as exogenous molecules. Why? You talk about Intresto, I'm going to need to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Intresto, when do you use it? What's your experience? I have zero clinical experience with Intresto. I've never had access to it. So and expensive. It's so expensive. Yeah. So yeah. I've... Yeah. I w I'd love to see more data. Yeah. I thought that we were going to get some clinical trials and then right. pharmaceutical company things happened and people didn't get access to the drug. So I have zero experience with Entresto, unfortunately. Watch this space, maybe. Yeah. 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 We're yeah. going to invite you again. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is, there's a whole episode right here. Absolutely. So, really. Thank you so much for joining us. You're so and welcome. it's short notice. It's, uh, we're, we're very That's grateful. That's what ECVM is all about. Great to see you guys. Oh, thank you very Great. much. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this series of interviews. We had a lot of fun talking to all these cardiologists uh, about their different fields and areas of expertise. And uh, it was a great, great meeting indeed. And yeah, this is the end of season season one. So what it's shall we do next? a poignant moment to, to finish the season, you know, with all these yeah. guests and all this kind of atmosphere around us in uh, in Barcelona at the Congress. It's uh, It's a bit of a strange thing, isn't it? Yeah. Do we just call it a day and that's it? Or, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of work goes into this, isn't there? It's quite, it's quite time consuming. But I have to say, I, I quite fancy a season two. Oh, uh, no, be good. Should, should we do it? I, 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 absolutely, I would be up to it. I'll be very right. Yeah. Let's see if people still keep listening. Uh, <laughs> for season two. Exactly. Maybe we can ask you guys out there if you want a season two um but yeah that would be great absolutely we should we should think about it fantastic um, let's do it let's do it we'll start booking some guests now we'll uh we'll go to the drinks reception and see if we can coerce anybody into joining us yeah we have we have interviewed 90 percent of the cardiologists <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, who's left you know yeah. <laughs> be... what what topic do you think we should do in season two i mean i think we've had this year we've had mitral valve disease pulmonary hypertension we, we had a, a very short talk with Roberto Santilli today about supraventricular tachycardias. Maybe there's more to think about with SVT. Maybe we should do some outreach programs and maybe speak to the surgeons. Um, I agree. And uh, I also thought we could bring some human cardiologists. It would be nice to have some human guests. And <laughs> so human guests rather than the usual robots that we, <laughs> exactly. that we interview. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh... And I also thought maybe we could ask, invite, the other day I was thinking we could invite a resident um, oh. to give us a, some input on uh, how is it to be a cardiology resident. And what are uh, we doing wrong? How can we do better with exactly. our training of the next generation of, uh, of talent out there? Yeah. That would, that's a great idea. It's nice. Yeah. And then something else that we may do next season would be to discuss some, some clinical research. We may invite... Uh, the leading authors of some research manuscripts out there to to chat with us, to briefly discuss their findings and to let our listeners be a nice way for the listeners to have a summary. And I think a great way for us to uh, to to get an insight into that research ourselves as well. So, uh, you know, True. fantastic to, to, you know, share that with people. So I already see a season three and four. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's start planning. Let's start exactly. planning. Great. Well, it's been a privilege, Jose. Thank you very much. And, uh, and you know, thanks to everybody out there for listening. Do stay in touch. We will be keeping an eye on the social media uh, over the winter break. But we'll see you in 20... Well, we'll see you. I don't know. You'll hear us in 2024. Great. Thanks very much, Kieran. It was, it was really, really great to record this season one. And please, uh, yeah, send us some comments uh, and ideas and, uh, and, uh, and feedback on, on season one so that we can... Uh, see those and, and improve for our next 10 seasons they'll definitely want less of us and more of other people that's okay we, can take <laughs> we promise that. that we'll facilitate that for the listeners that's good <laughs> all right take care jose thanks very much and thanks to everyone for listening out there cheers thank you